Now, while the drought has been driving farmers mad and gardeners mad all over the country, it has resulted in a pretty remarkable discovery for archaeologists. Author, photographer and founder of Mythical Ireland, Anthony Murphy, is on the line. Anthony, good morning. Good morning, Pat. Uh, First of all, Mythical Ireland, what does it do? Well, basically, I set up Mythical Ireland in the year 2000. Uh, I was doing a lot of research about the monuments and the mythology of the monuments of the Boyne Valley. Uh, It's a website, and uh, it's basically a glorified hobby for me, Pat. It's something I've been doing uh, as a sideline for almost two decades now. Uh, And so we can go on the website and we can learn all sorts of things about uh, these uh, places all around the country where the archaeologists have discovered great things. Uh, And sometimes we don't truly understand uh, the nature of the sites, uh, but that's perhaps for another day. Now, tell me about what has been discovered in the Boyne Valley because of the drought. Yeah, uh, well, you would imagine that everything in the UNESCO World Heritage Site around Newgrange Uh, in terms of archaeology, had already been discovered because the area has been under intense scrutiny by archaeologists for the past couple of decades since really the excavations of Newgrange and Nelth beginning in the 1960s. Um, What has been discovered is what we think is a a late Neolithic henge or uh, enclosure. Uh, There are several of these in the Bend of the Boyne. Uh, They date to shortly after the time Newgrange was built. So uh, just for the benefit of your listeners, Newgrange dates to about 3100 BC. Uh, The late Neolithic Henges would date sometime between then and about 2500 BC. Okay, so a 600 year window uh, where these might be uh, built. Now, first of all, the definition of a henge, people will think Stonehenge, that's a ring of stone structures, we've all seen it, Uh, but can a henge take different forms? Uh, Oh, absolutely. They are uh, large uh, uh, um, quasi-circular what we call enclosures Sometimes they're embanked enclosures, as in they have very large embankments. And there are a couple of very uh, stunning examples of those in the Boyne Valley, uh, including the Great Douth Henge, which is one of the best examples I- in Ireland. And uh, another one near the new discovery, called, which is just labelled Site P. You know, the, the, the monument labels in the Boyne Valley, they, a lot of them date to, you know, old archaeological maps where they were just given letters, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, this one um, has... A very interesting feature in that the, the the main ring is segmented and it's broken at regular intervals. And apparently this is a very unusual and entirely unique feature for an Irish henge. It is surrounded by what appear to be two concentric rings of post holes. Pat, you have to understand the enormity of this. This, this site measures about 200 metres in diameter. It yeah. would have... Uh, probably been constructed from wood. What we're looking at is wood, you know, wooden post timbers that have been inserted yeah. into the ground. Yeah, I, I, I w- once path. went on a visit to some of the excavations at the time when they were talking about the M3 and uh, the construction of it. And I remember being shown uh, post holes uh, where yeah. wooden posts, long since rotted, of course, would yeah. have stood. Um, so to the layman who knows nothing about archaeology, it's a hole in the ground. To the archaeologists, it, they can almost see it in their mind's eye. Yeah. Uh, they are enigmatic from the point of view, we don't really know what the purpose of henges were. They're often described as ceremonial or ritual enclosures. We know that they were different to the passage tombs. So if you can imagine Newgrange, if you've probably been in there, Pat, as mm-hmm. I have many times, the chamber of Newgrange only comfortably fits about 15 or 20 people. The Henge monuments are very clearly something involving a huge gathering, an open air gathering, a much more inclusive space. Uh, We're told that a Henge of this size could fit up to 2,000 people uh, within its circumference. So, you know, we're we're, we're looking at a very different type of monument to the passage tombs. Whether it's sacrifice or burial or marriage or whatever it might be, we simply can only guess. Maybe open air games. Who knows, you know? Yeah. Maybe an early version of hurling was played down there, you know? <laughs> um, the, the discovery then, I mean, this is, as you say, an enormous thing. And I've seen the photographs uh, which were taken by a drone. Is that so? Yes, yeah. So, uh, I, I, you know, as a, a photographer taking pictures of the monuments over the years, 
Um, I, I bought a drone about a year and a half ago because I, I had seen other photographers using them to image monuments. Like monuments like Newgrange and like the Hill of Tara can only really be appreciated from aerial photography, yeah. you know, and they give a whole new dimension to the monuments and, of course, their situation in the landscape, you know. Now, I, I presume when they were building this, they either uh, paced it out to make that uh, almost perfect circle or else they used um, some sort of a, a long rope made with vines of various kinds or whatever or cloth or whatever they had at their disposal uh, to use it to draw a circle effectively and mark a circle by, uh, I, I suppose, the way you would with a piece of string. Yeah, we're not entirely sure how they designed and laid them out. Two things about that. This one appears to be a carbon copy of Site P, which is in the field uh, right next to it. It is very similar in in shape and design and layout. Uh, The other thing, you know, in terms of, you you know, uh, the the design of them is that they were highly unlikely to have used metal tools. Remember, this is the late Stone Age. You're talking about people cutting down huge trees Without metal tools, the tools that were in existence in the late Neolithic were all made from stone and wood and bone. So in in any event, we're we're looking at a huge input in terms of labour, manpower and and sheer will and dedication to these things. The astonishing thing about the Bend of the Boyne is we have three of the largest passage tombs in the world, uh, 250 thousand tons of material at Newgrange, stones weighing up to 10 tons a piece that were brought up the river, strapped to the underneath of a barge, and several examples of these hinges that required an enormous input of labour. In fact, we're told by Steve Davis, um, who's an archaeologist with uh, UCD, that the Boyne, uh, the end of the Boyne now has the largest concentration of these late, late Neolithic enclosures anywhere in the world. So we so, really are talking about the equivalent of the pyramids of Egypt. Uh, yeah, I think so. In terms of the effort that went in. Now, yeah. how was it discovered because of the drought and why was it not discovered before? I mean, obviously drones make it um, m- m- more understandable that you can get the aerial view relatively inexpensively without having to uh, yeah. hire, hire a satellite to do a specific photography for you. Um, so what was it about the drought that exposed this? Well, it's highly unlikely you'll see this on the ground. That's the first thing. Now, I, I didn't quite understand the process, but it was explained to me by archaeologists. So the features that are under the ground are the holes and the pits that remain or that were filled in over time as the wood rotted away. Whatever tiny uh, trace water or residual water is in the ground gathers a little bit more in the archaeological features than it does in the surrounding soil. And what happens is, as the crop is growing up out of the ground, the crop that's growing out of the archaeological features is slightly healthier and greener because it has a a marginal extra water supply. And the crops growing out of the surrounding soil are yellower and drier. And what happens is, you get this contrast in the top of the crop between the, the healthier crop and the less healthy crop. And if you look at the images... We're seeing an image of what remains beneath the ground, but we're seeing it in the top of the crop, I don't know, maybe four or five feet above the ground. But these features are likely to be several feet beneath the ground. Now, will will there be excavation of this site now on foot of this discovery? To be honest with you, Pat, a lot of people are asking about that. Look, that's highly unlikely at this juncture. There are... um, Several of these, as I say, there's five in the immediate vicinity. Well, there's four others in the immediate vicinity of this. There are, I think, 200 or so monuments uh, within the UNESCO World Heritage uh, Park. You know, monuments and features that may be monuments. The vast majority of those are unexcavated. Excavations take time and money, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. And what what will we find down there? We'll find the holes, basically. So yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, um, a quick question uh, from a listener: Would you ask your guest uh, if they would use their drone uh, to look at what is thought to be the only Roman fort in Ireland at Loch Shinny near Port Ran? This is from Des in Dublin, and he also uh, wants to know what is thought to be the Irish Stonehenge in Louth. The stones were removed for road building and the location was only found a few years ago. 
Yeah, actually, Pat, I wrote about that in, in, in one of my books, in Island of the Setting Sun. That is known as Ireland Stonehenge, and it is located at Carn Beg outside Dundalk. Mm-hmm. Uh, at one time, um, thanks to a drawing made in the 18th century by Thomas Wright, um, we know that it was similar in scale to Britain's Stonehenge, but it had more circles of stone and it had very large uh, a bank around it. And as your listener correctly says, it was destroyed likely because the, the um, Dundalk to Armagh Road was basically built mm. through it or through part of it My at goodness. some time in the late 1700s. Uh, and they didn't realise it was vandalism at the time. And what about the Roman fort at Port Ran? Uh, well, I know very little about it, to be honest, but I'll have a look. It sounds okay. exciting. <laughs> All right. Yeah, on that note, thank you very much, uh, Anthony Murphy, who is the, uh, an author, a photographer, uh, a drone flyer as well, and founder of Mythical Ireland. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. The Pat-